Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for joining our podcast, Moms on the Move. I'm Jen Wills. And I'm Ashley Steigerwald. We have Haley Zayner with us today from A to Z Speech Therapy. So thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. So we um, obviously today we're going to talk about not just speech therapy, but kind of you know, behavioral and um, other issues with kids, ADD, ADHD, autism, um, what you're seeing. So if you don't mind telling us a little about yourself. Yeah, Um, I'm Haley Zaner. I own uh, A to Z Speech Therapy. We just opened in Greenville across from Bob Jones. And so we're very excited to have a new clinic space. And we work with both kids, teens, and adults. And I've been, um, I have my master's degree in speech pathology and I've been practicing for 11 years. Awesome, awesome. Um, Do you have any experience? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Two of my kids have gone through speech therapy through school. One started the early intervention, and you'll probably know the name of it through Greenville County Schools because I can't remember it. Uh, I don't remember. I'm not sure. I don't know. But he did the early intervention before kindergarten started, and then they both – my oldest did speech therapy through – like third grade, I think. And then my other one did it until – I think third grade, second grade, and then the speech teacher was like, he's not even trying anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, my oldest, he's six, he did it last year. Yeah, he was doing like the wrong pronouns, yeah. like just like him, her, mm-hmm. and then um, also like his G's. Anyway, I, I think like if you're not if you don't know the standard that they're supposed to have, I probably would have never thought to do it, but it was the teacher who recommended it. Yeah. I heard it and I was like, oh, that's really cute now. And then I thought when they were 18, and it was like, will you go out with me? And I was like, that's not gonna be cute when they're 18. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I get a lot of calls for okay. when they start to go into kindergarten. Yeah. And, oh, uh-huh. it was so cute, but now they're going into school yeah. and now it seems not less cute. cute. Yeah. Well, and also I feel like one of the biggest things that for me pushed me to actually be like, okay, let's get a handle on this was reading. Mm -hmm. Because I felt like if he was saying the wrong reading out loud yes yeah. that it, you know he wouldn't be able to read to his potential yeah and not just reading but spelling too yes, so yeah, when you true. see spelling. they're they're reading and the sounds might be wrong or when they're trying to sound out song sounds and if they're um you know saying a d instead of a th or a w instead of a r they're going to sound it out as a w um instead of those r sounds like wabbit instead of rabbit they might yes. try to spell those wrong as they're learning to sound out words yes yeah. yes yeah. he's still i mean he's he's gotten a lot better for sure um but I have a one of my friends, she's she was like a second grade teacher and she'd always be like, oh no, it's normal at this age. Because he was never like excelling. You know, you'd go to the doctor and they'd say like, oh, is he saying like 25 to 100 words at age, whatever. And I'm like, yeah, he's probably in the lower end of that. Um, but I mean, now he's now he's good um, in, in kindergarten. Yeah. So anyway, Great. I don't, yeah. I mean, I don't want to be like hyper about it, but I know that it was probably frustrating too. It's definitely better to be proactive and yeah. have speech therapy early on because a lot of times they can go through speech therapy and then get dismissed and then the reading's on track, you know, their sounds are on track and um, their language can be on track and so it just sets them up for future yeah. success. So it's definitely better to, you know, at least get it checked out or have somebody do a screening or an evaluation just to see so that, you know, if there's something to take care of, you aren't waiting until, you know, sometimes later or even in middle school sometimes I have new really um middle school and high school I still have some evaluations that I'm completing in schools and at the clinic and a lot of people just said wow I never thought to come to a speech therapist for help with my um for my teenagers really socially awkward and I didn't know that that's something you could help with and okay um they're like wow we never thought that we just thought it was normal nobody mentioned it before so Hmm. I know I think they're getting really proactive with the assessments yeah 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 Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We try. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, obviously, if you can, you know, get a handle on it early. Um, But it's funny, right now, my youngest, Bo, he's about to be 15 months. And the the, um, doctor we just had his well check, he's like, well, he's already a tough personality (laughs) guy. I actually thought he had an ear infection. They're like, nope, he's great. I was like, it's just him. Now you're paranoid about bringing him in. She missed an ear infection before. So now are you over paranoid about it? No, I had to go back because he had an ear infection. And then he... um, didn't get his vaccines oh. because of his ear infection. So, so we had to go back. And I was like convinced that he still had the ear infection because he's always like, Wah. 
you know, and that's just, thing. And it's just his like little award winning personality. <laughs> ear infections are, I'm glad you mentioned that because that's something that a lot of parents don't realize if, if a child's had chronic ear infections, uh, which a lot of kids do oh, before yeah. they have, um, and before they put tubes in, or sometimes they put tubes in, but then they fall out. They, um, if it's chronic, then there's fluid and buildup there and they aren't hearing everything. So you can oh. imagine if there's like little um, cotton balls or something kind of stuck in your ears. Oh, yeah. If they aren't hearing those sounds, then um, they sometimes don't pronounce them as well. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, it can cause some speech issues later on if they aren't hearing over a longer period of time. Yeah. Guilty. So yeah. my bad mom moment mm-hmm. when Trip was little, he would only pronounce one syllable of words. So instead of remote, he would just say moat. Mm-hmm. Or instead of catch up, he would just say chup. He would take the, the prominent and I thought it was a speech therapy thing. Yeah. Homeboy couldn't hear. Yeah. Ear infections, he was totally full <laughs> oh, of fluid. Homeboy couldn't hear. Yeah. So we had to go in for the ear tubes and, and they had to totally hear. Gone. Yeah, he was fine. He caught up after that, but yeah. Then I, you felt so guilty. Yeah. yeah. Oh my <laughs> he gosh. can't hear. We took him in for his well check, and you know how they do the beep, beep thing? Mm-hmm. And he, yeah, nope. Nothing. No, couldn't hear anything. <laughs> yeah, it's probably like a little bit like underwater, kind of yeah. like yeah. Yeah, a little bit. It, and, you know, for a short period of time, one or two ear infections probably isn't going to, you know, negatively impact them for a long time. But there are some children who are just really prone to them and they yes. have this reoccurring ear infection after ear infection. So those um, kids should definitely be pretty well monitored for, for their speech. And yeah. Hearing. Sorry, but kids. Yeah, at the well check, the doctor's like, oh, he's probably going to start getting, like, really frustrated because oh. he's not going to be, he knows what he wants, but he can't verbalize it yet. Mm-hmm. And, you know, terrible twos. But I'm sure that even as you get older, if the kids are having some issues and they get, like, frustrated and act out probably more physically. Absolutely. Yeah, I... I think that behaviors and communication go hand in hand because Mm -hmm. we think of behaviors as, you know, them being ornery or, you know, just trying to push my buttons. But so often that's just their way of communicating. And um, sometimes kids in school that are pushing or being mean, they just don't have the social skills or Mm -hmm. they don't have the vocabulary or they don't have the language skills to communicate in a more socially appropriate way. Mm -hmm. And so, so often when you, you know, teach them those skills to improving the social skills, improving the language, improving the vocabulary, then they usually can do that in a way that's more appropriate um but you also have to take into consideration their social emotional development and Mm -hmm. like how um if they're able to self-regulate and things like that so there is quite a bit to it and that's one of the reasons i love speech therapy is because i can work on kind of all of those things right at, at once what age do you mostly see um, I see a lot of um, elementary school, and then okay. actually I have quite a um, big population of high schoolers with autism that okay. are um, they're just working on their social skills. They aren't mm-hmm. communicating very well, thinking about looking for a job or doing job interviews or college interviews. Some of them are really, really smart, yeah, and so that. they don't understand. Yeah. Other children don't understand them. They don't really understand other kids very well, mm-hmm. and they don't. So we are working on you, what kind of things, how, how to enter a conversation, how to exit a conversation, mm-hmm. and how to stay on topic. And so it's kind of just this gap of you know these younger ones and then also high schoolers. One in 54 kids that yeah. at least is diagnosed. Mm-hmm. But isn't it a majority as boys? Yeah, and it's also so underdiagnosed in girls. So okay, okay. Yes. Um, yeah. it, for boys, it's a little bit more obvious. For girls, it's a little bit more subtle. It's more normal for a girl to kind of keep to herself and be a little quieter and shy and be a little more introverted. And so it is um, it is more prevalent in boys, but it's also um, underdiagnosed in, in I feel like okay. a lot of girls are better at matching and mirroring and masking mm-hmm. than, than maybe boys are. And it may be just a little bit more of the maturity or emotional intelligence. But I, I agree. I think it's underdiagnosed in girls. And I don't think it's I, I can see the fear. I think when you're pregnant, you're always afraid that something is wrong, wrong. or wrong. But I, I feel like the awareness of autism spectrum and like you said the amount of holistic therapy that's available now Mm -hmm. where it's not something where they're labeled and they're left there to figure it out there's speech therapy behavioral therapy occupational therapy and with with it becoming more awareness around it i think kids are getting diagnosed younger Mm -hmm. which is great because then you have a greater chance for intervention so i think it's less of something that hopefully parents are less afraid of now because there's more resources that being said uh, you know i want to look at it from the perspective of um, we have private insurance so you know we may have more access to some of these services than than families that don't have private insurance or re- relying on Medicaid Medicare yeah. kind of deal um, but at least the kids it seems are getting diagnosed a little bit earlier 
Yeah, and there is, I can't tell you how many times in working in the schools, how often parents get nervous because speech is still under the umbrella of special education because they're getting yeah. services mm-hmm. that aren't typically provided in their normal classroom. And so, I, but I do have to do a lot of reassurance of parents that they're not gonna be put in their own classroom. You know, they're not gonna, yeah. everybody, the, the individualized education plans really do give them just what they need, but not too much. And so it's usually they get to come play games for a little bit and there's not really the same stigma attached to it as it used to be a long yeah. time ago. And um, so I try to do my best to kind of put parents at ease about that and that they can have speech in school even if they don't have private insurance. Yeah. And um, it's not, this big weird they're going to be in the corner in the special room and special right. class so. yeah. and they yeah. do great about making sure it doesn't interfere with instructional time yeah. i found mm-hmm. the school was so accommodating with that making sure that same he didn't feel awkward or anything being pulled out and he actually i mean both my kids really enjoyed going to their speech therapist i, I mean it was like fun time too. i mean they got like candy at the end yeah <laughs> I, I was like i think they make it fun yeah because <laughs> right. you liked it too <laughs> sure. i find it really interesting about the high schoolers though mm-hmm. so is it mm-hmm. is it um social awareness and almost like public speaking or I'm, I'm just I, I don't know I find that fascinating yeah there's a lot of um, different uh, it's the, a lot of the students are on the autism spectrum disorder so it's you know a very wide spectrum some have very little communication skills and very uh, not a lot of them have really great vocabularies and their IQ is really bright Mm -hmm. but just communicating there's so much anxiety around Mm -hmm. it so um, we have to do some you know self calming strategies and just starting to improve that communication and make it more natural and more comfortable and also typically those high schoolers are really it has to be put in black and white for them Mm -hmm. and there are a lot of social communication rules, but they don't often get explained because so many children just pick those things up naturally. But there are a lot okay. of rules that you can explain to them. You know, one person takes a turn and let's let's keep track this time how many comments we've made, how many an- questions we've answered, and did we give the information that somebody wants or did we just say, I don't know, and if you say, I don't know, then does somebody learn something about you from that? You know, so just adjusting their communication and teaching them those rules that they may not have picked up on yeah. naturally. That's really interesting. So it, it looked like from what I was seeing that like almost all of the kids are able to be diagnosed before age three. Yeah, it, it just kind of depends. Again, um, it depends on the severity. Mm-hmm. And so it there's when you're younger, there's more variety in what's normal. Yes. And some kids have gone to school, some kids haven't, some have, you know, been exposed to more family members or less. Mm-hmm. And so there's there's just a lot of variety when they're younger, but when they're older, there should be certain things and skills that they have. Right. So it, the more severe a case might be, they're more likely to be diagnosed younger. Um, but if okay. they're older or maybe even a girl, it may be diagnosed a little bit later. Yeah. They may look typical at the beginning because there is such a wide range of what's yes. typical when they're yes. younger. Especially like boys and girls are just so different anyway. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Majorly. Yeah. Very different. I mean, yeah. <laughs> boys are just wild. <laughs> I'll never forget my um, friend. Our kids were born like three weeks apart, and she has a little girl, and she was sitting there like playing with the baby doll. I think they were like 18 months, and Bennett like ran over, dumped the baby doll out of the stroller, and started running laps <laughs> downstairs. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> and the open space turns into yeah. a racetrack. I was yeah. like, this is normal. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, they're just, they're wild. Um, yeah. But I was also seeing, like, for him and us personally, like, structure. Is that what you always, like, tell parents to really implement at home is, like, Yes, absolutely. Structure can be so helpful, um, especially for children with autism, too, who Mm -hmm. really rely on it. The more that's predictable, the more that they're going to be able to be in an environment where they can learn more and they can relate with other. They're going to be able to communicate better. They're going to be able to follow requests better if they know what's going on most of the day. So it kind of just takes away. If you think of them having like a full bucket of energy and attention, Mm -hmm. if there's certain things and routines there, then that's not taking up very much energy and attention. Mm -hmm. It's just part of the way that the day goes so teaching them something new handling with handling something that's out of the ordinary you know they've got more energy and attention for that if their day is structured and they know what's going on and so I like to you know have certain structure within my therapy sessions in the school so that they know what to expect when they arrive and so the more that you can do with those routines the more that um, your children can be uh, able to help with requests help with laundry help with this if these are all part of routines in the day um, you'll probably get a lot more help at home too yeah 
I always I like firmly believe that you know parents have like that gut instinct of like when something might be like a little bit off, mm-hmm. especially if you have multiple kids. You know, like you're a little yeah. more laid back. I think. Yeah. Um, but what are like red flags that? you know, maybe from an early education standpoint, we can start with that you parents should be aware of as not being maybe completely normal. Yeah. Um, are you talking about more for autism or for communication or both? Um, let's do both. Okay. Um, so for autism, something we would look at would be, you know, not using toys correctly, mm-hmm. um, like getting really hyper-focused on some of the like, pieces of them. Um, you know, instead of playing with a car, imitating what somebody else is doing with a car, you know, like picking it up and just spinning the wheels a lot of times, okay. like things like, and just because your kid does that, does not panic, yeah, 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 yeah. obviously. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, just kind of not really paying attention to what other people are doing and just getting hyper-focused on mm-hmm. some of those little pieces of it. Um, and then also, you know, a lot of sensitivity to textures, foods, and so sometimes that comes sounds. across the sounds too. Yeah. Um, if you put the, if you notice that you put one type of clothing on them and they get really uncomfortable or they're having a really bad day, you know, if you can pay attention to things like that, you might notice, oh, they have the Sensory. textures that yeah. are itchy or scratchy. Um, and it also comes across as sometimes being really picky eaters because they only like certain textures um, in their mouths and they, you know, different foods are really uncomfortable and it, it just makes them super uncomfortable to eat those things. Yeah. Um, and so things like that. Um, mm-hmm. But obviously, you know, having a, a specialist look at it or getting yeah. a screening or something like that could be eye contact. contact. Yeah. Eye contact, mm-hmm. eye contact is um, definitely something to be aware of, but it also is this thing where sometimes parents are so nervous about it that they like want their kid to look at them all the time and then it becomes <laughs> so some parents are hyper focused so I think I may have purposely left out eye contact because yeah, okay. some parents are so aware of that piece of it that they you know like have their kids do this all the time and sometimes it's not really appropriate and so it, it is something to pay attention to and if, if they're always looking down um, but there's also kind of this natural balance of sometimes we do look at each other's eyes and sometimes we don't yeah um, and then there's also sometimes this like just social some kids have social anxiety and don't really like it but they may not have autism Um, right so it could be more of an anxiety thing too so it it could um, be a sign for autism but it also could be social anxiety or something or your kids just an introvert that's okay too Mm -hmm. you know (laughs) we we were just talking so I was saying my middle son he um, he's four and my oldest is like real outgoing like he'll he'll sit there and be like I like your shirt. Where'd you get it? Where'd you, you know, like just he'll he'll talk to anyone. Mm-hmm. Usually he talks for my middle one. This is Brayden, and he'll, you know, my middle son. He's very outgoing. He's like wild man. He's hilarious. But if there's a stranger that comes and they're like, "Hey, like how old are you? What's your name?" Chances are now he might if he's in like the right mood. But chances are he'll probably just like stare at them. Mm-hmm. And it's not a bad thing, stranger danger. I mean, like, I, you know, and it's funny because my husband's very like, I was so shy growing up. And, you know, I think he's just like super cautious. And like, that's the word we're trying to use, not shy. Mm-hmm. Um, just because we don't want the to label. project like that, that onto him. Like, oh, you're so shy. So it's more, you know, he's super cautious. But um, school has asked us to do like an occupational therapy screening on mm-hmm. him. And I remember feeling like super confused about it because I'm like, I mean, he's so wild and I don't want to like jump to this conclusion, but I do see like the difference between Bennett and Brayden and I don't want him to grow up um, because it could come across as rude, Mm -hmm. for example, like, you know, if, if, if you're not answering somebody who's like, Hey, how are you? And he's just like, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> yeah if there's opportunities and my advice for that would be um if there's opportunities to kind of make him feel special or kind of pre-teach ahead of time like what's going to happen hey we're going to meet okay. this person and if you're going to go somewhere new or there's going to be somebody new there maybe talk about who's going to be there and hey if somebody says hi to you and kind of going over those rules okay. um i use a lot of social stories in my practice and so we can read a little story about like hey when i go to somewhere the ex- i i can say what my name is i can ask somebody how they're doing and mm-hmm. it kind of it's a first person story that walks them through what's going to happen before they get there okay and so those can be really helpful for so like prep- totally have- preparation preparation mm-hmm. that's yeah, really that's a great idea i love that, no. that. cuz my john gets like that my middle one gets like that sometimes and he's he he needs to know like if we're going in the car and mm-hmm. i was like we have errands to run today he's like where are we going 
How many uh-huh. places are we going? How long are we going to be at each place? How many <laughs> items do we keep? Like he needs the full day Detail. agenda or he, he's like not having it and yep. he's irritable the whole day. He needs to know. So I love that idea. And, and that's, a good idea. that's one of the things like I stress with my kids. Like I can't stand when people are like, oh, give auntie somebody a hug or something. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I don't like forcing my kids to like have physical interaction with mm-hmm. other people they don't feel comfortable with. Yeah. But I love that idea of we're going to meet so-and-so. You can shake their hand. You can tell them your name. You can... That's really, and with Facebook and everything, I mean, you can pull up pictures of Mm -hmm. who's going to be there and talk about it. And um, it again, it's kind of like those routines at home. The more that you can set up, the less anxiety that there's going to be when you need them to do something. I'm bad at that. Are you good at structure (laughs) at home? I'm not. Honestly, I'm not. uh, I mean, we have like just a structure that's developed. Like we have, you know, we eat at six. We, you know, we do tubbies at six thirty. We tubbies. (laughs) I love it. Tubby. Tubby time. So, um, <laughs> yeah. If you call me at 6 30, it's tubby time. <laughs> but yeah, so I think we just like have like ended up doing that. And honestly, it's probably more because of the baby. Mm. I think that Brayden and Bennett don't really need that. But Bo, um, he gets like, he starts fussing at 5 15. So it's like dinner time. And then it's, yeah. you know. Then he calms down after his bath, and then it's like playtime, and then he's done. I don't think that there needs to be so much. It's yeah. not necessarily the more structure, the better, because mm-hmm. there also can be opportunities for you know things to go wrong and learning yeah. from that. And um, so it's not necessarily like the more the better. If as long as there is some structure and predictability, I think that's fine. Yeah, you wouldn't beat yourself over bed at eight. <laughs> that is the one thing that I'm my like. Kids super are not strict. even in bed at eight. <gasps> Oh, I, my uh, oldest. Um, yeah. And I probably shouldn't say this because this goes on Instagram and his friends are on Instagram. But um, he's in ninth grade and I just put his bedtime to nine. Oh, wow. He was going to bed at eight. He <laughs> also wakes up at like five o'clock in the that. morning naturally. So he's yeah. tired at eight. But my, I mean, like, because I need my time. Oh, yeah. yeah. Seriously, I, I I'm know. I'm super strict about bedtime. My, this is what, and I've seen like memes about this, but I was just talking yesterday to a friend about it too. I don't know what it is about husbands. <laughs> They get like real playful right at bedtime. Oh no. <laughs> and no. they'll be like, all right, guys, we're about to go to bed. And Chris will be like, hey, Tony Bennett, <laughs> you want to go have a catch in the bonus room? And I'm like, don't. <laughs> like glaring at him. And I'm like, don't start. We just had tubby time. It's time to come yeah. down. <laughs> oh, man. But yeah, I mean, I, I get like very hyper because it's like I have like one hour to, yeah. you know, but yeah, bedtime is. It needs to be more structured. <laughs> they don't get about till like eight forty five. Uh, no. I mean Bo goes to bed at seven. No. Um eight o'clock. Seven fifty. Bye. You can read in your room. So nice. Just but I don't want to see you. Don't walk out. Mm-hmm. You don't need a cup of water. You don't need to go to the bathroom. I again. love when kids like they they need no. I have to go to the bathroom. No. I'm so thirsty. No. I need one more hug. No. One more story. No. One Absolutely not. They know what they're doing. I I had a family that did um, just 30 minutes of quiet time in the room, and they could do whatever they wanted in their room before bedtime. And so it was kind of just like before parents came in, like they kind of calmed themselves down a little bit. And so it's whatever's in your room you can play with or do, um, but it's just 30, like there's quiet time, and then there's like one last story, and then it's bedtime. I'm going to tell my husband you said that. you got to get their brains to just... Yeah, mm-hmm. and if they can do it themselves, then that's also helpful. Self regulation. That's really. Good. What about ADHD, ADD, um, executive functioning? Does that relate to speech at all? Yeah, so it, it can definitely work on the um, your ability to have like a full communicate, a uh, full conversation. Mm-hmm. So if you are, you know, not finishing your things or not doing your assignments or all of that, you know, can is part of executive functioning. And I love working on the <laughs> some of the kids that have ADHD. They I have a there's a you like what you need to do to get ready and then what you need to complete the assignment and then there's also like getting it done like which is turning it in or there's all these little pieces at the mm-hmm. end and the prep at the beginning that often get left out uh, so I encourage the parents of families that I work with to you know not just pay attention to actually the assignment that they need to be doing but there's usually like what can we prep and what can we prepare to make sure that they're successful make sure that they understand the directions and again um, it's like what you just said it's mm-hmm. the preparation like preparing yeah, I'm, really, I'm realizing yeah and that's tie, the other thing that's the thing so okay, I have one okay. ch- child I diagnosed with ADHD and that's the issue is he would trying to get him to start because I think he's overwhelmed he gets mm-hmm. overwhelmed with the 27 steps so it's taking step one seems overwhelming when you have 27 to come after mm-hmm. that so we got better at helping him get started kind of deal mm-hmm. 
But then he would do the work and then you'd check the grade two days later and it's a zero. And I'm like, why is this a zero? He just didn't turn it in. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you spent all that time doing all that hard work yeah. and put together something really wonderful and then you don't turn it in. Yeah. So is that like a common? Right. Yeah, it's, it's this, the what are what's the wrapping up? It's the, the cleaning up when you're done. It's the putting it in your backpack and forgetting yes. it at home or actually maybe you bring it to school, but then you don't turn you don't it in turn to your teacher. In. So there's so many other steps yeah. beyond um, beyond just doing the assignment mm -hmm. to make sure a kid's successful. And those kind of get left yeah. to the side sometimes. And so, you know, having a discussion when about how to prepare, but then also a discussion, okay, what do we need to wrap up and maybe giving a little checklist or, um, okay, did we turn it in? And did we, did one, is it in the backpack, you know, before mm -hmm. you even go to bed, making sure I did the sign, make it back in the backpack. A little checklist. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. But, yeah. If yeah. there are things that are really common like that, I mean, you could have a general assignment checklist. Like, did I prepare? Check. Like, am I working on my assignment? Check. Like, did it make it to the backpack? Did mm -hmm. the backpack make it in the car? And so, so often parents just ask their kids to do something, um, like cleaning their room, for example. And then yeah. they don't understand that cleaning your room to adult is a one step task. But for a kid, it's like, okay, the laundry has to go away. The toys have to go away. The garbage has to be taken out. The bed has to be made. Mm -hmm. You know, there's all these different steps. And so the more that we can break right. it down oh. and, and set that up, they, we can set them up for success a little bit more to be more independent and give you guys a little bit more time. Yeah. Um, if you can break those down, but it's so hard because for adults, we just think of it as one step, but it's, it's not yeah. to a kid. So the, I think the last thing I wanted to mention, like, you know, ADD, ADHD, mm -hmm. what are um, signs, you know, that parents might be able to look for? Yeah, so this is so tricky because mm -hmm. yeah. um, the first thing I like to mention when I talk about ADHD is also like screen time yeah. because if they are on their screens so often and everything on screens is happening so fast and so vibrant and so exciting, it sometimes can really affect communication because everything in the real world seems less exciting than their video oh, games right. and their yeah. tablets. And um, so, you know, it's, I would start with kind of taking an assessment of how much screen time they're getting and how much mm -hmm. interaction with other people because it is slower and it's you know but it's less exciting than a screen but it's really important to their development mm -hmm. and so um, if you do take down screen time and they're still just um, having trouble, you know, sitting for a really long time, but, you know, kind of practice those things with them and try to do some breathing exercises with them, try to get them to be kind of aware of their own body, maybe doing some kid yoga or things like that. There's a lot of things that I would that I would try. But if you've tried lots of different things, um, then I would suggest talking to your doctor about it. And for girls, it's a lot of times just like interrupting, not being able to wait, being impatient. Um, and for boys, Boys, it's usually a little bit more rambunctious and uh, a little bit more wild but just if it's uh, if it's impacting their ability to you know stay focused at school mm -hmm. Um, then that is a big concern, but also age is a big factor. So um, I read a study where, you know, depending on their age in kindergarten, if they were born in July versus, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> the end of the school year, that they're more likely to be diagnosed with ADD just because of their age too. So maybe take that into consideration if you do. That's why have we redshirted, which I know mm -hmm. is controversial. Oh, yeah. I was going to ask about that. Yeah, I think that that's a great idea for some of those younger. If they're if it's a really younger kindergartner um, and they've been having a hard time maybe a second year maybe more maybe really helpful for them um i mean just think of how much development happens and oh it's, yeah yeah it's crazy <laughs> yeah. Yeah. they're like a fifth of the rest of the class could be a fifth like older than them yeah. so yeah it, it yeah be a big difference we had yeah bennett is a late summer birthday and we we held him back and it, the difference that one year made yeah mm -hmm. um, it's huge and it can be so confident building a lot of parents are are worried that it's going to be hard on their self-esteem being held back but I, typically what i see is the opposite is mm -hmm. that they uh, are so confident they know what to do the next year they, then they become a leader and then yeah. they, they really grow and shine right so. but i think a lot of, of preschool private preschools and you know and, and religious preschools are so used to it now like for mm -hmm. example the preschool my kids went to they had you know k2 k3 k4 k5 and then they had yeah. high five mm -hmm. so okay. for them it wasn't even i'm redoing k5 it's i'm in the high five room oh, so yeah. i think a lot of preschools are adapting to that mm -hmm. and yeah. and because so many parents are opting to do that now yeah so where do they go, like, if the a parent's worried, like, okay, I think my kid might be on the autism spectrum, I think my kid might have ADHD, or even, like, a parent of a high schooler, because I think that's a really important mm -hmm. point, because I think um, when the kids get in the high school, I don't think parents think speech therapy. Mm -hmm. So what are, yeah, where, what's first step? Primary care, calling someone like you, how do they navigate this? 
Yeah, um, we uh, take doctor referrals. So we, when parents call us, we typically ask them to also check in with their doctor and primary care physician to send a referral over to us just so that we know that they're on board and aware mm-hmm. of what's happening too. Um, as a speech therapist, I don't make an autism diagnosis myself. Right. Um, so that would have to go through the doctor. Same with ADHD diagnosis. Those things go through the doctors. But once I... Um, those reports and that information can be really helpful. So then um, doctors or specialists can send, or parents themselves can send me those reports and then um, we can work on all those things. So I'm kind of more of the person that works on it, does the therapy Mm -hmm. and does the improving, but the diagnosis has to come from a doctor. So call your primary care first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. and I mean, just because, obviously just because you don't notice something or maybe you're noticing something later in life doesn't mean you miss something. Mm Because again, your kids change so often. Absolutely. Sometimes you don't want to overreact. Yeah. So, you know, there's, there's... I think teachers are an important part of that. Yes. Like you said, you know, your teacher yeah. brought it up because yeah. they yeah. see 30, 40 kids every year plus the hundreds of kids in the school and, and they can maybe see some nuance that... I mean, because as a parent, you only know your kid. Yep. Mm-hmm. You know, you and sometimes you're right, you get that gut feeling where you feel like something's a little off. Mm-hmm. But I think if you have that gut feeling, you know, talking to your teacher and kid's teacher and say, all right, what, what are you seeing at school? Because mm-hmm. sometimes they see something totally different. Yeah. Absolutely. And and there's also, for the older ones too, it's just if, um, basically, if their communication isn't what you want it to be, then yeah. they aren't too old to get help. Or if they've had therapy when they're younger and it didn't work, then mm-hmm. you know, it's still, if they may be more developed now and maybe more receptive to therapy and more um, able to improve. So I just wouldn't, uh, so many parents just take it for, oh, that's just how it is. That's mm-hmm. how it's going to be forever. Um, but that's really not the case. Right, I've, I've right. helped a lot of high schoolers and college yeah. kids. And well, and it's only going to help them succeed. Yes. Mm-hmm. So important. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. and um, I worked with a, a college student who stuttered, and he didn't he didn't tell anybody he just told everybody he was shy and then before he was actually about to graduate and he uh told his mom that i just can't say these sounds i'm really nervous and um and so he decided to get stuttering help as grad the year he graduated from college and so you know it it really isn't right never too late Mm -hmm. yeah That's awesome. Well, thank you. Yeah, Yeah, this was really good. Do you have um, like a handle or business that you want to plug? Yeah. Um, A to Z, um, at A to Z, S, C. Sorry. (laughs) (laughs) A to Z Speech Therapy. S, C is our Instagram. And um, you can find us at A to Z Speech Therapy.com. Um, is the two T O or T O? Okay, A T O Z speech therapy dot com, and uh, there's contact forms on our website too. Um, so you can also find us on Facebook. Well, thank That's you. Fun. I know I found this very yeah, very really interesting. Helpful. Yeah, like definitely taking tips away from that. Yeah. But thank you again. Thank you so much for having yeah, me. Yeah, we hope it. you enjoyed this podcast, and we hope that it was helpful in some way to you. Um, if you have any feedback, please let us know. And we want to thank our sponsors real yes. quick again. So thank you. <laughs> To Prime Lending. Prime Lending. <laughs> Blackacre Law, their closing attorneys. Yes. Parm Smith and Archenhold. Yes. And Wilson Associates. Real estate, yep. yep. Call us when you're ready to Please buy, sell, build. Call Re- Wilson Associates. Yeah. Anyway, thank you again, and we look forward to seeing you next time.